What is the purpose of purpose? My Oxford colleague Peter Atkins, author of a textbook of physical chemistry which is sold by the cubic yard in university campus bookstores, was once invited to give a lecture in Windsor Castle, which, as you know, is one of the official residences of the Queen. Prince Philip was in the audience. At the end, he asked that question which has become so familiar to me as a cliché. He said, science can answer the how questions, but what about the why question? Dr. Atkins was brief in his reply. Sir, the why question is just a silly question. <laughs> we are obsessed with the why question as a species. We humans obsessed with purpose. It seems perfectly natural when presented with an object to ask various questions about it. What color is it? How much does it weigh? How did it come to be the way it is? How does it work? But not all questions are suitable for all objects. What is the color of jealousy? Might mean something to a poet, but not to a scientist. How does it work? Might seem suitable for a machine, but not for a lump of clay. But the question of purpose, which doesn't necessarily have to have an answer, is one that leaps to the front of the human mind, whether it's appropriate or not. It does work for some things. It works for any machine, anything designed by a human with an aim in mind. It's a sensible question for a tin opener, a mill wheel, a rain gauge, a telescope, a toboggan, a shoe, a bicycle. For some artifacts like a digital computer, it is a sensible question, but it has a very large number of answers because it's a very versatile machine. Other objects like a sextant has only one answer. Anyway, where human artifacts are concerned, no one has any trouble understanding the why question, what is it for? It's for whatever the designer or the manufacturer intended. For objects that are neither manufactured nor living, the question of purpose is simply inappropriate, if not downright silly. What is Ayers Rock for is as inappropriate as what is the color of jealousy. What's the purpose of the Matterhorn, sand dunes, mud, the universe, the Grand Canyon? These are not questions that should be put. It hasn't always been the case that people have refrained from questions of this sort. In medieval times, I suspect that you'd have found people struggling after serious answers to all those questions. The answers would mostly have been concerned with benefits to people. The stars are there to beautify the night sky. Streams are to provide water to quench the thirst of travelers. This obsession with purpose was especially true for living things. Animals and plants were placed here for our use. Henry Moore, in 1653, believed that cattle and sheep had only been given life in the first place so as to keep their meat fresh till we shall have need to eat them. <laughs> and those animals that we can't eat were placed there, in some cases, for the purpose of elevating our morals. As late as the 19th century, the Reverend William Kirby thought that the louse was an, was an indispensable incentive to cleanliness. Savage beasts, according to the Elizabethan bishop James Pilkington, fostered human courage and provided useful training for war. Horseflies, for one 18th century writer, were created so that men should exercise their wits and industry to guard themselves against them. Lobsters were furnished with hard shells so that before eating them, we could benefit from the improving exercise of cracking their claws. Another pious medieval writer thought that weeds were there to benefit us. It is good for our spirit to have to work hard pulling them up. And it's not difficult to imagine this mindset finding a purpose in mountains and mud and deserts and stars. As I said in my opening, the human mind is obsessed with purpose. And this kind of thing persists to this day. If you study a well-made banana, you'll find on the far side the rest of the ridges. On the close side, two ridges. If you get your hand ready to grip a banana, you'll find on the far side there are three grooves, on the close side, two grooves. The banana and the hand are 
perfectly made one for the other. You'll find the maker of the banana, Almighty God, has made it with a non-slip surface. It has outward indicators of inward contents. Green, too early. Yellow, just right. Black, too late. Now, if you go to the top of the banana, you'll find, as with the soda can makers, they placed a tab at the top, so God has placed a tab at the top. When you pull the tab, the contents don't squirt in your face. You'll find the wrapper, which is biodegradable, has perforations. Notice how gracefully it sits over the human hand. Notice it has a point at the top for ease of entry. It's just the right shape for the human mouth. It's chewy, easy to digest. It's even curved toward the face to make the whole process so much easier. Seriously, Kurt, the whole of creation testifies to the genius of God's creative heart. You probably think that's some kind of spoof. It's not. Um, this pair, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron, are deadly serious. Um, I hardly need to point out it's rather an unfortunate example because the modern banana is heavily modified by domestic breeding. This is what a wild banana looks like. You might be interested to hear that, uh, that a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ray Comfort I issued a public challenge to me, offering me $10,000 to have a debate with him. I declined on the grounds that I was too busy debating the flat earth theory and, <laughs> and of course, the stalk theory of reproduction. But, but I added that I would debate Mr. Comfort if he would make a charitable donation of $100,000 to the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science which exists precisely to fight wingnuts like him. <laughs> Some creatures pretty much are for the benefit of humans because we have bred them so, as indeed the banana. The udder of a modern dairy cow is grotesquely enlarged compared to its wild ancestor. Its purpose has become a human purpose. A dairy cow's udder makes no sense from the point of view of natural selection. It certainly doesn't enhance individual survival, far from it. A modern dairy cow would be far more vulnerable to predators than a wild one, largely because it would be so difficult to run with the udder between its hind legs. Domestication is very much a special case, and it will serve me as it served Darwin as a kind of transition to natural selection. Darwin made great use of domestication in his books. Uh, the first chapter of The Origin of Species is devoted to the power of selection, in this case, artificial selection, domestic selection, to change the form of animals. If artificial selection can achieve such dramatic results in just centuries, think what natural selection might do in millions of years. I'm going to use artificial selection as a kind of softening up process to explain natural selection. If you wanted to do an experimental test of natural selection, what would you do? Well, the essence of experiment is that you, the experimenter, artificially intervene. You act as the selecting agent. This is a, an experiment carried out over some 70 years of artificial selection of maize, corn, for high oil content versus low oil content in the two lines on the graph that you see. And you can see that in a mere 70 years, there's a more or less linear increase in oil content in the high selected line and a shallower decrease. There's not very far to go towards zero oil. 